hosted over initially last three years, uh, and that uh, uh, became eventually uh, was reduced to to twelve. It was completed in ten. It cost uh, there's different estimates, but uh, anywhere from seven and a half billion dollars to ten billion. With a B. With a B, and uh, it is according to EPA the largest, most complex hardest uh, cleanup ever performed uh, in the largest Superfund site ever cleaned, which I think makes us the largest environmental site ever cleaned up. <coughs> Thank you. Representative Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what is your knowledge of the condition of the surface soil and the subsoil to some depth? Mr. Spring. Thank you. Um, the uh, the cleanup and characterization of the site uh, began uh, decades ago, but uh, it was most intensive during the 90s and uh, up through 2005. And so the cleanup was based on the characterization. There were, um, uh, I forget the exact figure, but millions of data points were accumulated. They were concentrated in areas of known contamination so they could delineate what had to be cleaned up. And it was done with a combination of tools. So the subsurface was done uh, by drilling holes. Uh, and the surface with a variety of surface sampling techniques and with surface instruments. Uh, some of these, uh, a variety, again, a variety of instruments with names like uh, Fiddler HPG and so forth, their, their standard environmental uh, radiological instruments. Um, and so those were recorded, uh, special mapping and statistical techniques used to, um, because these are data points and to connect the points, statistics and uh, special mapping techniques to uh, delineate where the contamination is. Uh, I think about three times to confirm work done at the surface, there were overflights done to pick up, um, you know, to fill in any gaps that there were. There were no known impacts out in the, the area that's now part of the, the refuge. Uh, for, the, for the most part, there were no known impacts there. The, what we call the central operable unit the central area that's being retained by the Department of Energy because that's where ongoing water treatment is being done, uh, was drawn to encompass the, the areas of uh, where contamination previously was and, and was remediated. Um, but sampling was also done out in the what was assumed to be clean areas to confirm that those were clean. And then these overflights by helicopters Perform to fill any gaps. Representative Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, but to your knowledge, what is the condition of the surface soil and the subsoil and to what depth? And I'd like to hear more about the ongoing uh, water issues. The, uh, Mr. Spring. Thank you. The, uh, the soil now has, has been remediated and Again, after remediation, uh, the sampling was done to uh, identify areas that needed to be remediated. The remediation was performed, typically excavated and sent to Nevada, uh, Hanford, Washington, Idaho, other repositories. Uh, and then confirmation sampling done to confirm that they were below regulatory levels. Um, those, um, so, the site uh, in about 2000, one of the major decisions that had to be made was to what level would this site be cleaned up? And that determination was that uh, it would be the actual levels, that is the, the levels that would trigger a remedial action would be set at a level that was protective of wildlife refuge workers because it was determined at that point what the future of the site would be, and to be protective of, if, if that uh, scenario failed, be protective of a rural resident and a rural resident child, were the three
three scenarios that were uh, the risk assessment was done to protect. Uh, so the currently, the, the refuge itself is is well is essentially a. Uh, for, the, uh, for most of the refuge, nearly all the refuge, it is essentially a background level, the same as in my backyard and yours. Uh, on the central operable unit where the, the manufacturing and uh, activities took place and where all the remediation took place, it is the level below the, the trigger levels, that is below 50 picocuries per gram. Most of it is well below that. In the subsurface, you ask about the subsurface, uh, there are only a few identified places where the, there is subsurface contamination. And those are well known, delineated, and to be, we make them part of our, uh, the current agreement we have with the Department of Energy. So those are known, uh, and there are no, no, so we're aware of where those are. For the most part, those are um, parts of subsurface floors and so forth. Uh, I, I forget about four buildings, the subsurface slabs, sometimes three stories underground were, uh, were left and that attached contamination was left in, in place. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, for example, there was a concrete floor and then it was left in place and then covered over with fresh dirt, is that correct? Uh, right. Mr. Thank you. With rubble and then a clean fill, yes. Representative Collins Marshall. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have several questions, uh, and I'll, I'll deal with them a couple at a time, but that's all right. Um, you said that um, this the, this area was cleaned up uh, equivalent to other areas in the state. Are there a, were there other areas in the state that had this level or any kind of plutonium? Plutonium contamination. No, Mr. Spring. Thank you. Um, again, I probably should clarify. We, we're we're talking back and forth across the, the fence line. Much of what we're talking about is is not the refuge area. Um, if we focus on the refuge area, that was beyond um, the, the cleanup effort. Uh, that was unimpacted by. This was called the buffer zone. It was beyond. It was. A, Purchased uh, in this, for the most part, purchased in the 70s to create a a buffer between the uh, the plant site itself and uh, um, well, security buffer the plant. Um, just so we can make that distinction. Um, when I refer to that, there there are no other sites with plutonium. The, when we have plutonium standards here in the state for groundwater, by the way, the the most stringent groundwater standard in the, in the nation for plutonium, two orders of magnitude, 100 times more stringent than, uh, than the federal standard. Um, when we talk about those standards, uh, plutonium only uh, is only here at Rocky Flats, so those standards were made with Rocky Flats in mind. So we have a method, though, to compare um, these sites with other sites. Most of the rest of the world, uh, most other federal agencies use a dose-based standard when we're talking about radium nuclides. EPA, in their remedial decisions, uses risk. We have to convert things to risk because that's uh, part of it, because that's something uh, that they and we can understand and we can use it to compare with other risks at other sites. In other words, a a, uh, what we would call a 10 to the minus uh, fifth or fourth risk. That's a, a 10 in, or one in a thousand, one in 10,000 risk. Uh, therefore, we can compare the risk of plutonium with risk from other um, agents, contaminants. And so we, the risk from an industrial side, a refinery, something uh, of that sort, residual risk we can compare to residual risk from plutonium. A 10 to the minus fifth risk from plutonium is the same level of health threat as a 10 to the minus fifth risk from uh, dry cleaner fluids or other contaminants. Thank you. 